When I met my wife, Nancy, it, it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. Over the years, we've grown closer together and every year it's gotten better. But when we first met, it was a very different situation. I li then lived with schizophrenia for about 15 years. This was 2005. And I was, I believe, <laughs> very inept socially. I had not had much opportunity to develop strong social skills or abilities and very little experience in relationships at the time. And over the years, being with Nancy, I've been learned that I've been very lucky to have met somebody so open-minded who I didn't even have to let know that I had schizophrenia because she already knew about it from articles that had been written about my family and me. And I've learned from um, some really great lessons in life, including that it's important to care about other people, be sensitive to their feelings, and uh, take, take their interests over your own uh, when they're a partner for you. Um, when there are times when that's really important to do that. So I've, every year it's gotten better. As I said, we just celebrated, celebrated our 12th anniversary a few days ago. And today we care for a beautiful dog and rabbit. And uh, we have some folks with us today who have a wonderful dog on screen. We'll talk to Jesse in just a minute. Um, but first, as, by way of introduction, uh, I want to say that I'm Brandon Staglin, and this is One Mind Brainwaves. Thank you, everybody, for watching today. So grateful to have you here. I think it's safe to say that we've all faced difficulties when it comes to finding, forming, and nurturing long-term healthy relationships. Those of us experiencing mental health conditions may face particular challenges, whether romantic, friendship, or familial, relationships can be rocky terrain, but it is navigable, and joyful outcomes can certainly happen. On this post-Valentine's Day episode of Brainwaves, two people are here to share with us their experiences and perspectives one who has lived with bipolar disorder, she's an amazing author, and another who's experienced schizoaffective disorder, he's an amazing artist, and they are mother and son. Later, our One Mind Cyber Guide team will tell us about an app that may help you manage your moods and understand them better. But first, her beautiful music has been described as music for the soul. She's also an acclaimed poet and author whose books start over again, details her own mental health journey. Her story of recovery has uplifted people all around the world. Joining me now from the hills be behind the uh, sunshine coast of Australia, singer-songwriter Emily McGuire. Emily, thank you, and welcome to Brainwaves. Thank you. It's great to be here. Awesome. Emily, I've been, a, as I said, a big fan of yours for over a decade now. I've been, your work has inspired me for so well over the years, including around the time that I met my wife. Um, so, uh, so thank you for your, your amazing music. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and you spent this pandemic year on your farm, far away from it all there in Australia. What has that yeah, been like? I, uh, it's been extraordinary. It's been, um, it's been extraordinary because I've been in the UK for the last 12 years, living in a tiny flat in a city. Uh, and then we, we basically came back to the family farm where my husband's family lived, um, where we used to live. And um, it was just six, just this surreal situation where uh, we're in Queensland, which is pretty much being COVID free. But I'm in constant contact with my friends and family in the UK who are obviously, you know, really suffering in the same way that people are in America and all around the world. Um, and, and yet I'm here living on a farm. There's no masks. There's no restrictions. It, it, is, it is really literally like I'm living on another planet. And uh, I feel kind of alternately abject guilt and abject gratitude for being here. So, um, but it is an extraordinary uh, place to be, you know, living surrounded by nature and, um, you know, the farm is, is in the hills and it's, it's very beautiful. It's very quiet. It's very isolated. And, and it's perfect for me. That, that is exactly what my soul needs. Well, it's wonderful to hear you in a good, safe place like that. And it maybe gives you more, more like mind space to, to be creative and work on your music and other, other art that you make, like poetry and stuff. Um, I wanted to ask yeah. you a little, bit of, a, a little bit about that. May, may I ask you about that? I was going to say, um, your song, Start Over Again, from your two th 2009 album, Believer, is about renewal and hope. And the verses are the basis of your book for, of the same name, in which you told your story of bipolar disorder for the first time. What inspired you to write that song? 
Well, I actually wrote it the last time that we were living here, so um, probably about 15 years ago. And um, my husband had built me my li a little hut, a wooden tin hut, for me to write in and to meditate in, because I practice meditation every day. And um, I wrote loads of songs there. I used to just, it had a bed and a wood burning stove and a place for me to put all my Buddhist bits and pieces. And I'd sit at the desk with my guitar, looking out over the Obi Obi Valley. And it was just the most inspiring, beautiful place for me to be. And so I wrote, I wrote so many songs there and Start Over Again was one of those. But really, I think it was one of those songs that I wrote when I was writing it, I wasn't really aware of what was happening. It was like, it was only much, much later when I recorded it for my album Believer in London that I listened to it and I and I suddenly realised I'd written literally the story of my life in three and a half minutes. <laughs> that was what was. And I hadn't really realised that when, when I was writing. It's strange. Some songs sometimes do that. You don't know what they're about until you until much later on they sort of reveal themselves. Well, that's amazing that that really quiet, beautiful place brought out that that kind of sense of who you were and that that flowed into your song, it sounds like, and 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 became, you know, that story which which then turned into a book, right? You you wrote your book in 2010, published it then, start over again. And uh, you were already a well-known artist then uh, when you published your book, but through poetry, prose, and song lyrics and, and personal diary entries, um, we learned about the remarkable story behind your artistic work. What made you want to share your history of psychosis and depression at that time? I just didn't want to hide anymore. I was, I'd been lying to everyone. I'd been doing all these media interviews and I'd talk about having fibromyalgia pain syndrome for years. And I talk about, I just, just talk about anything but being bipolar. And at the same time I was having breakdowns. And in 2010, the year the book came out, I had I was had a song on national radio in the UK. I was doing a big tour and I was having a nervous breakdown and I had the crisis team coming round to give me drugs in the morning so that I could get put my makeup on, go up and perform on stage. And I just, in the end, I just didn't want to hide anymore. So in true <laughs> dramatic style, I wrote this book, which was, the most raw and intimate I put everything into it I didn't hold back at all and my manager was absolutely horrified he rang me just the day before it was published and he said do you really want to do this you know do you really want to do this and um and I did and it was extraordinary the response was amazing it was launched on BBC National Radio over a series of three weeks and they were inundated with messages from people because stigma was still rife at that time and um lots and lots of people were saying to me oh you're so brave but I didn't feel brave at all I felt completely liberated that was it I was I was free and I could go and sing in hospitals I could talk about it people knew where my songs were coming from some suddenly you know it really was a case of the truth will set you free that is a beautiful story and did, did that deepen your relationship with your fans do you think that you you published that and they learned that about you Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I used to read, I do still read bits from the book at my gigs, you know, so they get to hear the sort of yeah. what it's like to have a psychosis, which is, I don't necessarily put it in very, um, you know, depressing terms at all. I sort of quite see, from my experience, I learned to see the light side of it. And there's some quite funny stories about me being completely off my head. You know? <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> they can relax about it they can relax because they know you and I think that's where you know really stigma only has power if you pander to it if you if you don't pander to it you say oh, to be honest I really don't care there's that wonderful quote Dr Zeus be who you are and um the people who mind won't don't matter and the people who matter don't mind I, you know exactly my philosophy that's one of my favorite quotes. I've quoted that before on the show. <laughs> We're the great minds think alike. It's so glad you're here with us today. <laughs> I love that. You know, you mentioned you perform for patients in mental health hospitals across the UK. Uh, and you've said that those have been some of the most rewarding gigs of your career. Why is that? And why is music so healing for, for people who struggle with mental health conditions like we do? Well, I'd say they're the most rewarding gigs that I've done, possibly because they're the hardest. They... So, you know, going into a, a mental health hospital and performing on a ward for, for very, very ill 
people is very, very difficult for me because I don't want to upset anyone. I desperately don't want to upset them and make, make it worse. I want to help. My mantra when I with my songwriting is I want to uplift, comfort and inspire the people listening. That's that's what I say to myself every time I perform. Um, but the reward from it is the reaction. I've, I've had the most extraordinary experiences in hospitals. There was one girl in a hospital in Bath who was absolutely catatonically depressed. She wouldn't speak to anyone. She wouldn't look at anyone. Um, and they told me that the staff there told me that she used to sing in the gospel choir. So I went over to her and I said to her, do you know any Bob Marley? And after we sort of got through, by the time we got through, I think Redemption Song and Three Little Birds, she was completely transformed. She was smiling, looking me in the eye, singing her heart out. And the staff were standing around in the room with their jaws on the floor. They just could not believe it. And I've also done, I've done gigs on many dementia wards where the patients no, have no idea what their name is, but they can sing every single word to a song. So it seems that music connects to a part of the brain that's very, very deep and it's not, effect, it's not actually affected by possibly even mental illness, but certainly by dementia. It, doesn't, it isn't destroyed by dementia. That is fascinating. It's just amazing to know that and amazing. You can connect with those folks in the way that you have done. And uh, I've experienced a little bit of that myself when I was undergoing my first episode of schizophrenia back in 1990. There are many times when I felt like I was like losing touch with reality. I put on my favorite songs that would bring me back and inspire me to keep on fighting in the moment. So I think I know where you're coming from. Um, yeah. The last thing I want to ask you before you perform your beautiful song for us, start over again, is, is that hope can be at times in a bit of short supply these days. What words of hope do you have for folks who struggle with mental health conditions? Well, I'd say um, after my first psychosis, when I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, I went through all the stages of being completely terrified and then chronically depressed. But then I started to feel a bit stronger and I started to realize that all this energy in my head, it could be something creative. It could be something I could transform into creativity if I chose to. So I would say from my experience, the best way to mental well-being is to find a creative outlet. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be knitting, it could be writing, it could be gardening, painting, learning the guitar, drawing, singing. It doesn't matter what it is. Just find a creative outlet for all the amazing energy in your head. Mm, I love that. I love that. That resonates with me as well. I love to play guitar myself. And so that, that's my outlet. But um, I, think, I think we're together on that. Um, so thank you so much, Emily. Uh, can we hear your beautiful song start over again, please? Be mine, 
Thank you, Emily. Wow, that was so beautiful. I feel so calmed and uplifted by that song. Thank you very much, Emily. Love that. Thanks for sharing. Absolutely. So you've just poured your heart out for us, and we are so grateful for that. Um, are you willing to do a lightning round with us as well of a few questions we can ask you for the grand, like the encore performance uh, for your appearance on Brainwaves? And uh, okay, okay, great. So remember, this will take us 30 seconds exactly uh, or less. Um, I'll ask you five questions and just answer with the first thing that comes to your mind, okay? Great. Here we go. <sighs> what helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? Medication and meditation. What gives you the most stress relief, a person, dog, or cat, or other? A dog. What type of music or song do you turn to when you are feeling down? Bob Marley or Bob. <laughs> What's the biggest misconception people have about mental illness? Um, ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, that we, I can't pass. I can't answer that one. Pass. Okay. What, okay. Here's a good one. What gives you hope? Um, waking up each morning. Yes. Thank you, Emily. All right. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Lightning strikes twice. <laughs> Emily, I really appreciate all that you've shared with us today, your, your beautiful song and your stories and, uh, and the lightning round answers. Um, and I think you'll find you have a lot in common uh, um, with, uh, with Jesse and Kaylin, who we're going to talk to in just a moment here about their work at fighting stigma and so forth. Yeah. So, so thank you, Emily, for being on with us on One Mind Brainwaves. Feel free to stay on. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You're welcome. So today we're going to talk to two experts and two people with lived experience they are uh, to discuss some of the challenges that people with mental health conditions face when it comes to building long-term satisfying relationships and the happiness that is possible. Jesse Close is a speaker, mental health advocate, and author of Resilience, Two Sisters and a Story of Mental Illness. And also with us is the artist, Kalen Pick, and he's also Jesse's son. Jesse and Kalen, welcome to Brainwaves. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, both of you. It's great to see you again. I hope you guys are doing okay there in Bozeman today. Yeah, yeah we are. It's Thank snowing you. again. Holy <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I hope you start staying warm there as well. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And, and viewers, don't forget, you can post questions for our guests at any time during the, this webcast in the comment section of your Facebook window there. So please, if you have any questions, go ahead. So Jesse, um, I'll start with you. First of all, I love the title of your memoir, Resilience, and it's an absolutely riveting story. Your story of living with and coping with and surviving what, is, what was eventually found to be bipolar disorder. You dedicate the book to your family. It's about you and your family and your relationships with your family. Why did you want to share your story and talk about these relationships when you wrote the book? 
Because I guess primarily it, it, it's a good story. And secondly, I, I wanted people who have bipolar disorder or any other kind of mental illness to, to see that there is hope and that it's possible to stay alive. And um, yeah, that's it. Well, it, it totally fits. I mean, it's the, the name resilience because you have been through so much in your life, trials and, 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 and challenging times, and you've come through them to be the amazing person that you are today, speaking out against stigma and helping to inspire other people. So I really Thank admire your work. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Kaylin, you also live with and have recovered from a mental health condition, a schizoaffective disorder. And just to clarify, this means that you occasionally may have symptoms of both schizophrenia and mood disorders. Your mother talks about your story in her book. How did the development of your symptoms influence your relationships with your family and other people in your life? Pretty dramatically, I think. I mean, um, I was uh, about 16, 17 when I started having trouble. Uh, first, it was ADD, then it was bipolar, and then <clears throat> the severity was kind of bumped up and up and up. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it um, mostly for me, it, it, it affected my relationship with my family in that I would kind of, uh, you know, I think that they were thinking bad things about me and, um, you know, kind of... Uh, paranoia, I guess. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, that, that was a big thing with my own, with my own family. Yeah. You were concerned about things they might be thinking, even though it was mostly in your head and, yeah. and that, that must have, um, Jesse, you must have noticed that, uh, when Kaylin was developing that, how did that, how did that affect your relationship with Kaylin? Um, well, in the very beginning we fought, um, and the longer it went on, I realized that there was something really not okay. Um, for example, we were living in a house. Kalen was living in the, in the, an apartment above the garage and he came down and pointed to the TV antenna on the roof and said, mom, you know what that's for, right? I said, yeah, it's for TV reception. And he said, no, they're keeping track of me. So that was like the very first re real Delusion. conundrum. Yeah. Delusion. And uh, I didn't know. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know. I mean, I hadn't been treated yet either. So mm. we had some pretty bad fights. Yeah. And uh, it, he didn't want to use medication. He wanted to go to a naturopath. And he did. And nothing. Yeah, that didn't help. No. Not really. No. At the time. Yeah. No, not at all. And I think he was on some pill that you had ground up into powder on the floor in your apartment upstairs. Okay. Sarah Quill, mm -hmm. I think it was. Yeah, super sedating. Medicine. Yeah. So, oh. he, no, I don't like this anymore. I want, a, I want a naturopath. So I went to a naturopath. And after that treatment was zero, um, I talked to the guy, to the naturopath, and I said, you know, if you have somebody who is behaving and speaking strangely, um, you need to ask that they get help elsewhere. And I don't think it sunk in with this guy, but anyway. Yeah. Jesse, that was brave of you to advocate for Kalen's well-being uh, on his behalf with that, that naturopath. And it evidences the bravery that you show in, in many aspects of your life, as I read about in your book. Um, I wanted to ask you, you, you uh, well, first I want to say I really admire that, that kind of closeness that you have together um, to take care of each other like that. Um, 
you talk extensively in your book uh, earlier on in your life about your own history, your own history with romantic relationships, including several marriages. Uh, you discovered boys at an early age, but it was not always a smooth or happy road. What affected your mental health and your struggles to manage it have on your ability to find a healthy, loving, mature relationship? With a husband, I never did. Mm. <laughs> I, I never did. I've been, let's see, I left my last husband in 2004, and I haven't had a boyfriend, nothing since. And this is probably the most productive years of my life. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't want to take care of anybody. <laughs> That's take awesome. Care of myself. And that, you know, I have a big family and everybody's pretty great to both Kaylin and me. It's true. They're very understanding. Yeah. That's great to hear you. Uh, you I imagine you've deepened your, your knowledge, your self knowledge, your understanding of you, how your ins and outs are and, and your relationships with your family members, which is tremendous yeah. in and of itself. Well, I have to say as an aside that 2004, I had been to a hospital and I was put on medications that actually worked. And I, you know, I didn't no longer had that mania where you try and find somebody and, you know, it, I'm very happy with my dogs and my family. <laughs> That's great. And, and dogs are part of the family too, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. don't, don't, don't you agree? Yeah. 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 I love my dog too. He, he's our, my wife's and my uh, joy and, and, and uh, in our lives. So yeah. love him a lot. Cooper's his name. Um, yeah. Kaylin, um, one of the most challenging aspects to finding a romantic relationship, especially if you're long, young and looking for one, it can be the stigma surrounding mental health. You are now in a healthy relationship, happily living with your wonderful wife, Meg. How did you first meet Megan? And when you first started to talk with her about your condition, how was that for the two of you? Well, I, I talked about it from the very beginning. And I think she had information about it from a friend who introduced us. Um, so she was, and she was, again, from the beginning, very accepting of it. I mean, she wouldn't have put up with... Uh, any, um, you know, ser serious issues or anything like that. But, um, you know, she's been, she's been quite understanding. That's yeah. great. That's great. Um, and it's, it's heartwarming to hear how, how um, the two of you take care of each other and nurture each other. Like uh, when I was visiting with you guys um, last year, uh, learned about how you know, she was going through a tough time. You're helping her with that. Um, I, I love learning about how close you guys are. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, today, we're talking about how people who've experienced mental health conditions find, form, and nurture relationships with Jesse Close, mental health advocate, speaker, and author of Resilience, Two Sisters and a Story of Mental Illness, and uh, her son, the artist, Kaylin Pick. Viewers, don't forget, we want to hear from you. If you have questions, comments, or any thoughts for our guests, please feel free to post them at any time. And if you know of anyone who could benefit from the, the insights and perspectives that our guests are sharing today, please share this webcast with them. Kaylin, back to you. Um, so for those dealing with lifelong mental health challenges, there can be an inherent vulnerability in romantic relationships. But as we were just talking about, you and your wife support each other in, in just these beautiful ways. Can you talk a bit about that and how you have the supportive relationship? Yeah, I'm... Um... You know, she, uh, it's, it's, I mean, as far as I know, I mean, it's a, a pretty normal relationship. I mean, um, we support each other in, um, you know, daily activities as well as, you know, maybe doing some adventurous stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, we just try and communicate and, um, yeah, support each other in any way we can. That's beautiful. Uh, and uh, um, was she, have you had past partners and has she been more supportive than, than those? 
Um, yeah, I've had a few that probably weren't as quite as accepting or, or supportive. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, Meg is pretty exceptional. I have to say. <laughs> it's great to hear. And you talked about how you support each other at some adventurous things that you do together. What kind of things do you, do you like to do together? Um, we like to go hiking and, um, you know, skiing and camp and stuff like that. I mean, um, get, we like the outdoors quite a bit. Awesome. I totally empathize. Um, one of the first things my wife and I did together, actually our first date was a hike. We went on, on a hike with some friends and then our second date was another hike. And so <laughs> we still love to hike. We celebrate our anniversary a few days ago with another hike. And so it's one of our rituals too. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so Jesse, uh, your sister, Glenn Close, the actress, contributes various chapters sprinkled throughout your book. And she served as a strong source of support in your life. Yeah. 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 And yeah, it's great to see that and to know that. Um, working with my family with our, a little bit of support from us, she also founded this amazing nonprofit, Bring Change to Mind, that works to raise awareness and fight stigma and discrimination surrounding mental illness. And you yep. participated in that. And it, it's truly a family affair um, and family Family focus, uh, family relationships are a big focus of the organization, and it was an honor to participate with you and with Glenn and you too, Kalen, all of you, um, in the launch PSA that we filmed together in Grand Central Station in 2009. It's full of fond memories of that. Well, Can you talk yeah, go ahead. What were you going to say? I asked her when I saw the prejudice. You can call it stigma, but I think prejudice is a stronger word against myself and Kaylin, I asked her to please help do something about that. And she did. Uh, she went to Fountain House in New York and uh, kind of started to get the feel of everything. And uh, then she, I think it was your she and your parents um, started bringing change to mind. Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh, is someone coming in? Say oh. hi. Hi. Oh, hello. Hi. Oh, Glenn, hey, good to see you. How are you doing? Good to see you. Thanks for joining us today. This is our One Mind Brainwaves webcast, and Justine and Kaylin are on it. I'm so glad oh, you could join us. Say, I just have to say hi because I'm running off to do something with my with Annie. So anyway, <laughs> hi, <Scott. laughs> we'll have to do it. Let's do it again, okay? Yeah, let's let's do that. We're talking about bring change to mind right now, and so hopefully you can come back and talk more about that with us on another episode. Yeah, yeah. and hi to everyone who's on the. The webcast. <laughs> for sure. I'll say hi to my mom and dad for you too. And they say hi back, I'm sure. Please do. Okay. okay. Love to you. Bye. You Thank you. <laughs> that was serendipitous. <laughs> Good to see her. Well, she yeah. lives right next door. Isn't it great to have that kind of support and that, that kind of knowledge that your, your family's right there with you like that? Yeah. It's been really, really wonderful having her next door. Her dog comes over and says hi all the time. And <laughs> you know, Pip. Yeah, Sir Pippin. Yeah, yeah, he's awesome. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure you give him a lot of attention and love too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So these caregiving relationships, these family relationships are so important to the recovery of people with chronic mental health conditions like we have. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? About the what? The importance of caregiving relationships for people with mental health conditions, how they support us. How they're supported. How, pe how people in our family who help take care of us, help support us in our recoveries. Oh, um, I, there are quite a few people with mental illness that call me once in a while. And um, it's just, so important to be able to talk about how you're feeling. Um, I'm guilty of when I'm down, I usually just go upstairs and- Isolate. Um, huh? Isolate. Yeah, I isolate. 
but one prop I have found, and this sounds really silly, but I love, I, I get calmer when I do a dot to dot book. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because all your thoughts, everything is just placed on a shelf while you go from one number to the next, to the next, to the next. And it always makes me feel much better after I do a dot to dot. <laughs> That's great. You have that. That's an activity that brings you kind of back into yourself, I imagine. And, yeah. And yeah. anybody can order a dot to dot book. It's, mm-hmm. it's uh, and then... The other day I was feeling really down, but I realized that the weather has been so awful that I couldn't even go outside for a walk. Um, It was, what, 20 below? It was really cold, yeah. About 20 below, yeah. Mm -hmm. So today's better. (laughs) Good. These factors can really influence our, our, our mental health. Uh, it, and it must be great to have Glenn, your family so close by, you know, you don't have to go out very far to see somebody in your family for that kind of support. Right. No. Yeah. And I, um, I call them my people, these people who call me and um, we just talk, you know, I mean, two people with mental illness on the phone just talking is a wonderful gift Mm. Um, just to go back and forth and well, you know, how are you doing now? How are you doing? And, you know, stories is, yeah, it's, it's pretty great. You have that common basis of of that profound experience that you both share to, to talk about and to, and to kind of build upon and share insights about that. I imagine it's great. You have those connections that you formed through, through all your life. Jesse and Kaylin, um, as, as someone who's experienced mental health challenges, how has the pandemic affected your capacity to nurture and strengthen your relationships? First, Jesse, and then Kaylin. Our relationship? Just relationships that you have in your life with people. Oh, um, well, we can, our family can be around each other without masks, thank God. Um, I... I have felt that that feeling of claustrophobia, of not being able to to go out anywhere. And I, you know, it's um, it ha- it hasn't been great. Um, it it's a trial, really. You know. Yeah pandemic i've had one shot so far i get my second one on the 25th but then you're still supposed to be careful so i don't i don't know yeah, it's like an added, an added layer of um oh well, it's not an odd layer it's a <clears throat> it was such a profound uh shift in direction you know i mean to have all the restrictions and the proto- you know, all that protocol kind of dumped on us, like, you know, change your behavior kind of thing. I mean, I think that that affected me a little bit, but yeah, you know. me too. Yeah. Does it, uh, does it make you feel more uh, like restricted in your life? Like you have yeah. this additional layer of, um, of uh, like limits on yourself. Does that, does yeah. that affect you? Yeah, that's that's kind of the, the what, what I think about when I think about how it affected me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, gosh, I mean, it's been hard for for so many of us in our country um, and all around the world to deal with it. Uh, you know, as Emily was talking about too, uh, her friends in the UK are going through this difficult time. Um, but uh, it's great you you have each other and your family to to rely on, and, and you have Meg too, um, Karen. Yeah. And uh, I hear you just got a puppy. Um, that that's beautiful to know. Uh, Jesse shared that with me by email. And uh, um, how is the puppy? Uh, how has your relationship with your puppy influenced your uh, your mental health and your relationship with your wife as part of that? I didn't expect this, but I've had dogs most of my life. But 
this little guy, like picking him up and, and having that added responsibility, I think. And, uh, um, he's just such a, he's such a joy to be around that it, it boosted my own, um, mental health, I think. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm sure your mom can empathize with that, have with her dogs and everything. He's so cute. Yeah, oh he's my cute. God. <laughs> yeah, that wrestle puppy. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. So um it's time for the fun part of the show. Uh, to finish okay. out the show with our lightning round. You guys ready? Yeah, sure. Like we did with Emily. Okay. So um Kalen, we'll start with you. Does that sound good? And then go to Jesse. All right. Thank, uh, I'm glad you're game for this. Thank you. So those five questions, 30 seconds each. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I made a mistake. We're going to go back and forth. So I'll ask the first question, then you answer, Kalen, and then Jesse. Okay. Then the second question, then Kalen, then Jesse. And third question, Kalen, then, okay. Okay. okay here, we, here we go. Ready? Here we go. What helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? Uh, good food, friends, and animals. Uh, my dogs and music. Mm -hmm. Awesome. What gives, which gives you the most stress relief, a person, dog or cat or other? I'm going to have to say dog on that. Yeah. Dog. Right dog. on. <laughs> what type of music or song do you turn to when you're feeling down? Rock and roll. Ah. He took the words out of my mouth <laughs> from the seventies. Yeah. Seventies mostly. Yeah. Love it. What's the biggest misconception people have about mental illness? That we are violent, horrible doing, um, uh, you know, monsters, which is not true. Yeah. I, I've lost a lot of friends since resilience came out and there's just the prejudice of people not understanding that I'm just a person. I'm the same person that I was and that I've always been, you know, I'm just better now. I can actually function and, uh, you know, so that's my answer. Yeah, that is awesome. You, you know yourself. That's awesome. Finally, what gives you hope? <clears throat> gives me hope. Uh, insight. Basic insight into myself and into the world. Into Gosh, what gives me us. hope? Um. Friends, um, sisters, my my three children, my grandchildren. I have three grandchildren. Uh, if I'm ever feeling without hope at all, all I have to do is go see my grandchildren. And they call me Lala. So... <laughs> Where I come in the door like, Lala, it's Lala. <laughs> Nobody can stay down with that kind of reaction. I love it. I love it. Those are such great <laughs> answers. And, and I, I love hearing about your experiences through those answers. So thank you for sharing that. I love that. Um, great, great, great. Thank you both. Thank you so much for being with us on, for this interview on Brainwaves today. And viewers, thank you too. We want to um, say a few things about emotions. They can be like waves, but sometimes tracking our emotions and, and under, can help us to understand them. So our wonderful team at One Mind Cyber Guide is going to talk with you momentarily about an app that can help you do just that. One Mind Cyber Guide team, take it away. Hello, my name is John Bunny, and I'm a digital mental health specialist at One Mind Cyber Guide. We spend lots of time talking to people about mental health apps, what they like about them and what they don't like about them. In our research, we've heard from lots of people that one barrier to using mental health apps are concerns about privacy and security. This is understandable as in some cases you might be entering sensitive private information about your well-being 
which you don't want other people to see. Just like any other technology you use, you should only use apps you trust and are confident in their ability to protect your data. Any app you use should have a privacy policy that informs you about how the app handles your data. In a recent study, we found that over half of apps for depression don't have a privacy policy. You can check for a policy in the App Store at the bottom of the app page. If an app doesn't have a policy or you are unsure of the security of the app, avoid using it. At One Mind Cyber Guide, we review privacy policies to check if key pieces of information about what happens to your data are covered in the policy. We believe developers should be as transparent as possible about how they handle data, so you can make informed choices about the apps you use. Dailyo is an app made to help you track your mood. With each new entry, you record your mood, what activities you are doing, and other notes to go along with your entry. Various activities listed include reading, exercising, and gaming, but you can create custom activities of your own. You can also set reminders to help you consistently enter your mood throughout the day. Over time, you can view statistics and trends related to your mood and activities. You can also review your mood in a calendar view in Dailyo, you can set goals for yourself to help strengthen a desirable habit or reduce undesirable ones. You can further personalize the app to your liking with various color options and various moods and emojis that you create. Upgrading to premium removes ads and unlocks features such as unlimited moods and goals and infinite reminders. We've reviewed Dailyo at One Mind Cyber Guide and it scores 3.67 out of 5 on our credibility scale and a 4.14 out of 5 on our user experience scale. You can learn more about Dailyo on our app guide at cyber.guide slash Dailyo. Stay tuned next week for another app review. Thank you, CyberGuide team. And thank you very much to you, Kalen, and you, Jesse, and also Emily McGuire for being with us on Brainwaves today. Don't forget, you can post questions and find all of our past Brainwaves episodes at onemind.org slash brainwaves. Hope you had a good time today and look forward to seeing you next week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Mental health is stepping out of the shadows and into the spotlight. I think I need help. Can you talk? Struggling. I'm here. Depressed. Can't sleep. But we need the science and solutions to change lives. Now, more than ever, we are in this fight together. We are of one mind. Accelerating brain health for all. Help us fund new treatments at onemind.org.